Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDag, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDag is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDag, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. Hello and welcome back to the Roka Report podcast. Today we've got a special guest who was at Sunderland for a heck of a long time. Uh, started from the Roy Keane era, right the way up until the Chris Coleman era, which I'm sure many of us remember. And I think it'll be an absolutely cracking story. We've got former strength and conditioning coach, Mike Clegg, just recently left. How are you doing, Mike? Are you well? Yeah, I'm doing very well, thank you, Graham. Thanks for the invitation to come speak on the Roker Report, and I'm looking forward to see what we start talking about, and hopefully there'll be some decent stories within it. Yeah, there's one or two, mate, of questions that hopefully we'll pull some stuff out, but um, <laughs> before we start, you left just in the summer. Um, what are you up to at the minute? Yeah, I left in the summer. It was um, one of them where I just got married um, on my honeymoon. Congratulations. Thank you very much, and you get this phone call, and you're, you're half expecting... You know, something which is not very nice because you've been at the club such a long time. There's been a transition. The club has been relegated over the previous two years and you get this phone call which is very club official and me and the missus were thinking, oh, what is this going to be? Because I, I love being at Sunderland and when they got the phone call, it's a, a basic, you know, you're not you, <clears throat> you're not going to be staying with us anymore. We're going to terminate your contract. You know, it, it was a sad day for me, sad day for the family. My missus is from Sunderland. And um, I'm still living in Sunderland at this moment in time with two children. And um, for as much as I love being at Sunderland and as much as I want Sunderland to do well, I do wish that that was done in a slightly different way. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, that sort of soured my actual um, honeymoon a little bit. But these things happen and maybe these things happen for a reason. But that doesn't take away the, you know, the 11, 12 years I was, I've had at Sunderland. I've loved every minute of it. Good. It's nice to hear that. But yeah, I mean, I think... Well, we all watched the the Netflix documentary, and I think when Stuart Donald came in, you had seen that kind of hub of positivity because Ella Short had gone. But then between the staff, you seen that sort of worry of like, like the media department chatting. I don't know if I want to keep the job and stuff like that. And it must have been must have been a bit of a weird time for you because from a fan's perspective, you just wanted Ella Short out and things to change. Yeah, I think for the two years from when we, you know, we struggled over the last three or four years and ultimately when we got relegated when David Moyes was the manager as a staff we were all worried very worried thinking what does what's the implication of that for ourselves and everybody who's been at the club whether they've been there six weeks six months or six years or 12 years like myself it was, it's a bit daunting because you start obviously worrying about yourself and um, uh, once once in the championship I stayed um, Ellis Short knew about my reputation and, and he was still around there and um, the medical department and the doctor obviously felt there was value in me being there. So I stayed that year, but once we got relegated again and a new ownership come in, I always felt the writing was on the wall. And um, you know, like I say, I expected that to happen to a degree. I just wish it was done face to face. But I think certain aspects of and the change had to happen. Um, obviously, with Ellis leaving, Stuart Donald coming in, I think that, that needed to happen. And I think what, what Stuart's done, what the rest of his team have done from that has been brilliant. You know, they the, the connected again with the fans and they refreshed things. They got rid of some staff, but they kept some really good staff as well, um, especially in the area where I worked. They, they kept the likes of and the doctor, you know, Dr. Glenn Ray and um, Paul Walsh with the sports science and Peter Brand and Chris Naseby as physios. And I'm really pleased they're there. And I'm really pleased they've had such a good start to the season. I know about Jack Ross. Um, um, I know his reputation's great and listening to everybody at the club and also people away from the club who are knowing football, they really think he's got a good reputation. He's going to do really well with his career at Sunderland and um, further on as well. Yeah, I've been really impressed with them. And I think, you know, the way the club has turned around in mood has been a vast change. But one thing I wanted to sort of ask, because there'll be plenty of people who are not experienced in your field and will be interested to know what your day-to-day -day job was when you were at Sunderland. So strength and conditioning coach, what does that include on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, to give you a little bit of um, background <clears throat> on this, and um, when I was six years old, my father opened the gym mm -hmm. in um, East Manchester, in Ashton-the-Line. And um, I was 
always in the gym you're watching people train you see what they did they learn you learn about how the body moves and um and as time went by i did karate i did um helping my dad clear the weights away and you start playing football then from that when you get a little bit older i started doing what's called olympic lifting olympic lifting is a uh, actual sport which is in the olympic games it's the the snatch and the clean and jerk and the derivatives of them exercises and that sort of set me up to be quite a powerful athlete so therefore after my career and i decided to retire i went back into working at my father's gym he decided to get qualified and i felt like that's been my real passion in life and football was almost you know 10 years of um, playing a game and just enjoying doing something but my actual true passion regarding a, a job was strength and conditioning so once I did two years there, Roy Keane became the manager of Sunderland. I knew Roy. We had a big history with Roy regarding me as a, as a player. My father as a strength and conditioning coach at Man United for 10 years. And Roy brought me to Sunderland and we, we set up about this project. The Drummerville Consortium had just um, took over. We had a bit of a clean slate to bring in what we wanted to do. And right at the very start, we decided to be a, a really um, high energetic, explosive team who really needed to work less on their aerobic conditioning but really on their explosive power and be a high press team who, who could really um, win games in the last five to ten minutes and me and another um, coach who started Sunderland called um, Scott Ainsley, sports scientist, excellent sports scientist, you know, we devised a, a, a long-term plan over over two, two or three seasons where we think we could develop with, with the squad. Roy was more than happy with that and he allowed us to uh, really impl implement what we felt was best practice. And throughout that, we, we my job on a day-to-day -day basis is um, um, assessing players when they come in, you know, what, what's their readiness, are, are they ready for the endeavours of the day um, from that that you're linking with the physios and the nutritionalist and then it's a case of you know, what individual plans do the players need to get themselves prepared to go out on the pitch so we do activation sessions um, we do specific days working with specific groups depending on their injury history and then then they're on the pitch and when they're training on the pitch with the sports scientist and the actual football staff I'm inside in the gym and I'm working with long-term rehab lads who have been injured um, within that, you'll be working with lads who've had ACL injuries or even short-term injuries, making sure that they don't lose their aerobic conditioning, making sure they don't lose their um, speed and power, and ultimately working on their weaknesses in the gym, which can help them to be a better athlete once they get back on the pitch. Um, once the boys are finished training, they come in, and then in general, there'll be some type of gym work, whether that be uh, flexibility or whether that be actually a gym session itself, strength or power or speed. And then there'll be plenty of time for recovery, so we take gym sessions or actual weights in the pool area where we might do some swimming or some type of recovery protocol. And then in the afternoons, I predominantly work with the youth team and the reserve team where I develop their long-term plans, work through their LTAD, their long-term athletic development. So therefore, you're trying to prepare players long-term to, to enter that first team, not being too big a jump where they can't handle it uh, physiologically. Um, so that's how it is and it's not all about me it's a multidisciplinary team like I say there's there's lots of stakeholders within that sort of um, medical department and we all work together as a unit to try and give um, <clears throat> the best provision we can to the players with um you mentioned about the the last minute goals and stuff like that and I mean anyone who remembers that period even like the first couple of seasons in the premiership the amount of last minute goals we scored was massive was that I think I'm asking an obvious question here, so forgive me, but how huge of a focus was that? Yeah, it was designed to be that way. We had a system where, which has is, is changed over the years with different managers. Some managers are very kids' gloves and they want to think, we need all the players fit and we don't want to train too hard and uh, we want to make sure this, that. but that is the wrong way to be. You need to make training extremely intense. You need to periodise training throughout the week so different days have different elements what you're trying to achieve. But ultimately, we had the uh, the idea with Roy and with Scott, it was like survival of the fittest. And instead of like downgrading the training sessions to the weakest, we upgraded the training sessions to the best and the, the fittest so therefore the lads who couldn't handle it they got injured and you know the, we wasn't bothered you know they went into the gym and trained yeah. and once they they got used to the intensity and the and, and the, the expectations what were on them then they could therefore then get used to that type of level of training but w w with Roy with his intensity with the guy he was you know we used to sometimes train the hardest on the Friday which is, um, in most people's eyes, a ridiculous thing to do. But what Roy used to do when he used to watch, he tried to find out and have a look at you know, who's actually, whose brain's on the game, who's yeah. ready, who's intense, ready for tomorrow. Because it was only be a short session and you, you could get a feel of somebody, you know, they're taking the eye off the ball, they're trying to save themselves. But he wasn't interested in that. At that point, we was like, you know, 
raw, hungry animals. He was ready to, you know, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then if you do that in training, ultimately in the match, you get your rewards. And we got a, la a lot of last minute goals and we was renowned for that at that moment in time. And, you know, uh, myself, Scott and, and Roy and Tony Lachlan and um, Neil Bailey was a, you know, we, we was um, adamant that that was a, a, our prime driver, you know, intense train and then we'll get our rewards at the right time. In terms of players you've sort of worked with, I mean, over, I mean, there's a, a lot, what, 10, 10, 12 years yeah. that you're at the club, so I'm, I'm maybe asking a, a far-reaching question, but there's a lot of players that had injury issues with Sunderland. I mean, off the top of my head, Wes obviously struggled, Jan Kirchhoff struggled, uh, Johnny Williams recently as well. Um, how do you manage players like, say, Wes Brown, Jan Kirchhoff, Johnny Williams, as opposed to someone like, say, Jermaine Defoe, who just seemed to be like this naturally fit guy that just doesn't pick up injuries? That's a great question. and I talk about this a lot with um, Wes Brown, actually, on my recent um, podcast, um, uh, which I did yesterday. And some players need to be managed and some players are almost like thoroughbred horses. But a lot of that comes down to recruitment. So when you get your uh, your players who are coming in, as a medical department, you're looking at your, sh your sheets and players come in and think, oh my God, wh why are we bringing him? And a lot of the time, unfortunately for Sunderland, the type of players they always sort of brought in, especially was in the Premier League, was, was players with great pedigree, but normally they had injury issues. Yeah. You know, so you brought in somebody like Wares, who, you know, is a great lad, he's kept himself going for years, but he had a lot of injury issues. Therefore, you're going to expect that he's going to break down. And it's very difficult as a medical department thinking, you know, we would, we, we would turn most of these players down if we're talking about, you know, we want longevity, we want consistent playing on the pitch, but they're coming in and you've got to manage that then. And it's very difficult. And whether it was Jack Rodwell, Kirchhoff, Wes Brown and many, many others, you know, when these boys are coming in with a bad injury history, it's a nightmare for the medical staff. And, you know, sometimes they maybe get a little bit of critique um, regarding how many people get injured but believe me the recruitment of the players has got to be the first is are they talented second is you know how, how resilient are they how, how many injuries have they had in the past otherwise you, you sort of almost you spin the plate the wrong way in my eyes and um, it's something which is um, it's difficult because sometimes big names attract people attract uh, uh, the club to these um, players but it doesn't always work out as, as good as you think was there any particular player that when you looked at his medical sheet, you just thought, fucking hell. Like, the injuries were just so lengthy and you just thought, where do I begin with that? We've done it. We've had, we've had players that come in and the powers that be are saying, we need to sign him, we need to sign him. We've gone downstairs, we're scratching our heads and saying, fellas, if we sign him, we're going to we're gonna put our jobs at risk. Yeah. So we'll, we'll try and put some type of baseline testing, whether it's some type of jumping or whether it's some type of um, power test or an aerobic test. And I remember when Mick Brown was at uh, the club and we were saying, you know, I, th I think the owners at the time wanted to bring somebody in and we're saying, not a chance, we can't touch him. You know, this is this is like just throwing money down the drain, and um, unfortunately, I don't always know who had the power regarding um, signing some players, and I don't always think they. I mean, let's get it right. How many times have we done panic buys over the years? Oh, you no, know, it gets until last last day or two of the of the transfer window. The fans quite rightly thinking who we're bringing in. Suddenly, prices are being risen. You know, the year the, the amount of money some of these lads are on. We're getting these lads thinking, what, what on earth are we doing? We are we are going to create our own long term issues, and ultimately that's what Sunderland did. So I, I think there's got to be, you know, we know everybody knows when the transfer window is. You got to try and make sure you plan, so therefore you're not panicking. And when you're panicking in the last minute, unfortunately you end up over paying for players and over paying for players who've got good names but have bad injury issues, and that's what we've always found there. Someone, someone on Twitter asked a really really good question in reference to uh, Jack Rodwell. Mm. Now Jack Rodwell had documented injury issues. But I think the more, especially with the Netflix series and the other stuff and the interviews that came out, there seemed to be a heck of a lot of mental stuff with that. With Jack Rodwell in particular and, and other players, how many times is fitness also mental sometimes? Because it, it felt like Jack Rodwell just was worried about getting injured all the time. Is how do you how do you approach that as a medical staff for someone who you think is maybe scared to push their limits in case they get injured, and it's because it's more of a mental than maybe physical. No, and that is the, the very fine line of pushing training so you actually allow the body to exert itself to its maximum on many, many occasions. Therefore, when you come to the game, it should be within your threshold of movement yeah. capabilities. Um, but again, it comes down to the training. The, the training, when I was at Man United playing, 
you know, the training was that intense and it was that competitive. You know, when we played the games on Saturday, it was actually easier. You know, of course. Well, it's obviously playing against 11 v 11 Man United training and Alex Ferguson is expecting to see blood and tears, you know. And then when you've got a Sunderland squad where you're thinking, well, I've got 13, 14 players who are our first team players. We can't afford to lose anyone else to injury, maybe, because that's our squad. Therefore, the training itself is not quite as intense as it should be. Mm -hmm. Then you come to the game and then boom, this is full intensity action. The other lads don't give a shit about Sunderland lads and we end up picking up injuries. But when you talk about the mental side, of course, you know... When you get in these cycles of being injured and you're not working the body all the time, yeah, you're doing work in the gym, but it's very, very different to, to the work you do on, out on the pitch, especially at the high levels of intensity. And that's why like the GPS data and stuff and the sports analysts have come in and sports scientists, and they're trying to recognise that and understand whether the people are in acute loading phases or long-term, how does that match up with individual training sessions? You're trying to red flag things if things are getting a bit out of order. But again, if the player is not prepared properly they're then doing the right things away from the club because we can only control the controllables they've got a, a lot of hours away from the club and their preparation and obviously their mental state is, is massive and even though we have a psychologist down at the club he normally work well he does actually work with the, the academy we didn't actually have a first team psychologist and the psychology itself is, is a grey area you might have a sports performance psychologist is different to someone who's like a clinical psychologist or somebody who's worried about their performance on the pitch is very different to somebody who's got to you know work out some type of childhood trauma or some type of abuse what might be going on so it's a difficult one and I think that area of um, uh, development for players we, we look back you think of the quality of coaching what's improved over the years people getting their B licence A licence and everybody's got to be licensed now quite rightly then you look at the provision in sports science and strength and conditioning and the um, the qualifications you need to work in these areas psychology has still not been took on big time and I think that's an area which will be a booming industry in the future. It's just how does it fit within a football club which doesn't feel awkward, where you sort of think, well, if I go and see the, the psychologist, I'll, I'll look a bit weak. Or, you know, it's just got to be a, 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 you know, a part and parcel of the, the provision which is provided. But psychology is a massive one, massive one. And one of the big issues I have moving forward is I'm always worrying about the younger lads who are going through the system, the academy system. There's many, many players in the academy system all throughout the country. And a lot of these players, of course, because it's like a pyramid system, only so many players can get to the top and all these players are ultimately getting released at some point. You know, I have this debate, you know, what's the average age a player retires? So I'll ask that to you, Graham. What is the average age a player retires? 34. See, 34 is the absolute wrong answer. And that is a, a deluded statement by anybody yeah. who thinks that. Because if you think of the playing pool of players or academies when they're 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, there's, there's probably 15, 16 in every year group. Not very true. And suddenly yeah. you get to an academy and then at 16 to 18, you might have 20 players. Then you get to the under 23s. Under 23s is suddenly five year gap, but you've only got 12 players. And then there's this incredible abyss between under 23s to first team where thousands and thousands of players can never get through to the first team. Uh, there's a massive influx of um, foreign players. There's a massive influx of uh, just players going from one club to the next, one club to the next. And there's an absolute the bottleneck of play. So all these young players who for years and years and years think they're going to be a football player, they've even been took away from their peers, whether that's in schooling or whether they've just been um, um, took to these football academies. Now, they're even open academies, which are football-specific academies, and they're doing their education. Once they actually get released, or they might even fall down a tier, so you might leave Sunderland, leave Man United, go and play at another club. You might go to a, like a Berry, or say if you leave Sunderland, you might go to a Spennymore or a South Shields. But ultimately, you know, it's very, very hard to get back up. And then yeah. for the rest of their lives, they're thinking, oh my God, I thought it was going to be a football player. It didn't happen. They couldn't, you know. For me, psychology, linking that back to the Jack Rodwell thing, is a, a massive area. And um, my sort of public outcry will be, you know, we really need to be thinking about that because he's going to be, my, my child's nine. He's at the academy at Sunderland now. And um, luckily enough, um, I've kept him in the shadow squad rather than travelling around going to all the, the, the games playing Everton and all these different, you know, Everton and Liverpool and Man United. And, because I, they end up spending a hell of a long time on buses, a hell of a long time away from their normal friends and family, not being able to be exposed to other sports and mm -hmm. swimming. And I, I just think at some point this could blow up in the face of 
um, youth football. I think it needs a, a massive rethink. They brought in this ECPP system, which is is fine. It's caused massive amounts of paperwork to be done by coaches. And again, I just think there's got to be this balance between art and science, and uh, it be very interesting to see where it um, leads to. So that's a long-winded question. <laughs> no, answer, no, sorry. Good, really good answer, mate. Really good answer. Really, really interesting. Um, from from a side of um, once someone asked, like, how difficult is it? for you in the role that you do when you're changing managers so much i mean it affects the fans it affects the club it affects the players but then you've got like medical staff because if you look at the likes of i mean i could be wrong you'll know better but when you look at someone like paulo de canio to say sam allardyce or like sam allardyce even to david moyes it's so different and obviously you spoke about roy Keane, where you had a plan a project it's someone that you knew very well you knew why you were brought in then you go to who's after that? Well, Sabrasia would have been, which would have been so maybe a slight transition. But then you move into say Steve Bruce again, Man United. You might get him better, but he's going to have a different plan. How difficult is it for you going from manager to manager in the short succession that we did? Because it, it must have felt like the players and your job was getting pulled from pillar to post. Yeah, well, lucky enough for me when Steve Bruce came in, I did know Steve. But ultimately, he, he's come in with his own crew of people. So mm-hmm. he, he brought in Keith Birch in, he brought in his, his sports scientist, um, Will Royal, he brought in Stephen Clements, and they've got a very clear and defined um, understanding of what they want to achieve. And quite rightly, that they're allowed to express that. You know, the manager's just been relieved from his duties. They've come in, and wherever they've been, they must have been doing well. So therefore, put that strategy in place. So for somebody like me, with with, with Steve especially, who I had close contact with, uh, it's a case of you know you've got to look and see and um, take advice from them. But then over time, as you become more experienced, you, you see uh, flaws in every manager and every sports scientist who they bring in uh, what they do and you, you try and add to the quality of what they're trying to bring. So so for me, I was never one to get on, on my soapbox and tell people this is how it should be done because there's many ways to skin a cat, there's many ways to climb Mount Everest, as I always say to my clients. And um, ultimately, you, you absorb all this information and you try and get you know best practice in and around that. Um, but when different managers come... <coughs> They, they come with different um, personnel and um, I've worked with many different sports scientists over them years. Um, some managers come with, with very little staff members. Dick Advocat come with just him and his assistant manager. So they needed a sports scientist from the club and that's when one of my good friends, Scott Pearce, got an opportunity to work with the first team and he, he did a cracking job there. And uh, again, w- when things change and another manager come in, Sam Allardyce come in, he brought a guy in called Adrian Lamb, and Adrian Lamb was a very experienced practitioner, and in his work at all different clubs, such as Toronto and Chicago and Leicester and Newcastle. So for me, um, because my position was um, quite unique in its in its sense, I was never a threat to anybody. I was always somebody there who would offer advice. And because I've been an ex-player, I think a lot of managers and other sports scientists were quite willing to listen to that. Um, and, and I just magpied everything and, and took all this information and built up a, a massive reservoir of knowledge. And, and through that, I think it's, it made me the best practitioner I could be. And it's quite interesting. As I've become better and better and better, I ultimately get relieved from my duties at Sunderland. But that only means that I can actually practice my... Uh, uh, my skill or my art to many, many more people because the projects yeah. I'm getting involved now are not just <clears throat> 25 blokes in a in a gym in Sunderland. That I can now have the opportunity to um, explore um, um, opportunities all over the world, which I'm doing. So, uh, in a roundabout sense, it was an absolute blessing to be um, relieved from my duties as well. So, with fitness, and you were talking about uh, Roy Keane before and how it was really intense, especially on the Fridays. Now, obviously, the football on the pitch didn't go very well, but I remember, I remember sort of during the Paulo Di Canio era, I remember looking at some of the players and like I remember like Jack Callback who must looked like eight stone wet. He obviously wasn't, but and he had these huge biceps in the Hong Kong training, um, the Hong Kong tournament. Sorry, when Paulo Di Canio came in, there's many, many, many stories about Paulo and many many bad ones and crazy ones but from a fitness perspective what what was he like because he seemed to like never i think it was matt kilgallen said they didn't really have a day off yeah i mean paulo was a very very professional type of guy um he had his own way about him and when he come in it was it was a big shock to me to be fair uh, you think you 
especially in the political sense, you look at the region, what Sunderland is, and then suddenly you're getting this guy who's got different type of political thought processes, and I know that caused its own issues. Um, and he was allowed a lot of power. He, he actually disrupted quite a lot of good things, what were going on. Mm-hmm. But because of his impact, and he had that, his personality, his, his charisma w- w- was great. And the impact was great. You know, obviously, we, we stayed up that season, and then he started the next season, which didn't go very well. But he brought in a lot of staff members, and it, it was awkward and little things like, you know, we had got adequate staff anyway. And we also use experts when we had issues regarding injuries. You'd send them to like a UK specialist for the knee or UK specialist for the hip. Mm-hmm. But they just wanted everything to be exported over to Italy. And it wasn't a good idea. It caused m- m- many issues internally. And um, unfortunately for Paolo, he had strange ways about him. You know, he, he had this this way of within the environment of being a bit obsessive therefore yeah. it made it awkward for people to express themselves maybe a little bit like um, Mourinho had at Man United more recently yeah. he had certain we- weird r- rules really where um, you wasn't allowed to have music in the gym so people didn't like going in the gym you had to be silent so he didn't like people almost having laughs and jokes in around the place he expected almost like you know, like a, the, the Italian military almost feeling. Yeah. I think it just, again, when a new manager comes in, everybody's trying to impress, but once the drudgery of the day-to-day sets in and things weren't going well, there was many, many issues ultimately, uh, which explored into that very, very famous um, uh, meeting in, in the green gym where I used to do a lot of my work, where um, the manager said some things out of order, did a few actions which riled the players and the players had a little mini um, revolution against him. And it was, it was the right thing to do, though, because I, I think if the club would have carried on with Di Canio. I'm not quite sure where that was going. The likes of um, Carlos Queller, John O'Shea and a few other um, older players stood up against him and ultimately, you know, uh, he ended up leaving the club. Yeah, so, but the different managers come and go. There's some managers I probably liked and other staff members probably didn't like, you know, and it depends how you bond with people. And sometimes you have a manager who's, say, like Big Sam. What I loved about Big Sam, and not saying me and Big Sam got on that well, but Big Sam was incredible at empowering his staff. When yeah. he walked in, he'd set up a meeting, he'd, he'd, and he'd go around the table, like, name, job. Um, job, and he knew everybody, he knew everybody's name, a bit like Sir Alex Ferguson was. And then he'd, he'd say to, to all, you know, right, what are the resources you need so we can empower you to be the best coach you can be? Because for me, Cleggy, I expect you to be the best. You should be the best strength and conditioning coach in, this, in the entire country. So whatever you need, you get it done. And I remember, you know, I thought, okay, well, this is what I need, da, 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 da. And he said to myself and um, uh, the sports scientist at the time, Adrian Lamb, and our psychologist who we had in uh, called um, Danny Holmes. He now works at Middlesex University, a great lad. But he pretty much said, right, get everything prepared for the start of the new season. So uh, next season come, we, we had our staff meeting and he had a wander around like he did, like the, the sergeant major. And he went, Cleggy, what on earth is this? So the gym had ordered stuff. But it's only a small off season. So yeah. it takes six weeks for stuff to come. And I went, Gaffer, it's going to get organised. He said, it's an absolute disgrace. Absolute disgrace. <laughs> I told you what you should be doing. No, he said, I, I've given you the resources, yeah. what you need. I've given you the money, the budget to get done. And just at that moment in time, just behind the back of um, uh, the training ground in Cleveland there, the van come round. <laughs> I said, Gaffer, the van is there. I said, I didn't even think you'd be in the first day. I said, we could only get it in today. So the van's out. I'll come and see you in a bit. And I'm like, oh, shit, right, okay, right, lads. And I got brought in all those, the, the, the ground staff and the physios and the guys who come up from Perform Better, which was the company who supplied us. And we just absolutely destroyed the gym. We moved everything, <laughs> got everything organized, and the gym was absolutely mint. And then I thought, right, I'm going to go upstairs. So about half past five, I went up to see the manager, Big Sam, come downstairs. And he put his arm around me and said, I didn't expect anything else, Clay. Well done, son. <laughs> I thought, flipping heck. I was probably burnt about 10,000 calories that day. But that's what Sam did. He, he wanted to empower people so they felt good about themselves. And it's all about, when you have staff members, you know, what is it? You know, don't employ them unless you're going to give them the power to actually act. You know, with some managers, 
they wanted to be in control of everything and it, it become very awkward and everything you did was and I'm not just talking about me, especially in the, the medical department, you know, it ended up being on the sports science, they weren't quite allowed to do what they wanted to do. Yeah. And it ended up being a you know, obviously everything's a, a collaboration. You need to discuss what, what needs to be done. But sometimes managers was like, No, you know, you, I I'll I'll run everything. And that becomes awkward then. You you see, you know, issues which can um, stem from that. When we spoke to Jan Kirchhoff. Um, it's really funny you mentioned that. I asked him the difference between, for him personally with fitness, I says, you know, like with, with Sam Allardyce, you seem to have, it It worked for you for some reason. And David Moyes comes in and he just broke down constantly. And I was like, what's your opinion on it? And he said, you mentioned about Sam Allardyce and he said, I had so much freedom with the physios and the fitness people. He's like, it was a case of he went, well, they're the experts. You know your own body. You discuss with them. I, I trust them. And talking about empowerment there, said when David Moyes came in, it was a case of, I don't, not a direct quote, but essentially what he said was he'd push, he'd push him to a level where he was like full tilt and he was knackered. And he was like, unless you get to that level, you're not fit. It's like, and then I'd go on the pitch and my body would just break down. And I think Sam Allardyce for a long, long time seemed to be a person that had an awful lot of emphasis on sports science and stuff like ahead of its time, essentially. And then Moyes came came in and things personality wise obviously changed. How drastically did it change from Sam Allardyce who seemed to be like ahead of the curve to like David Moyes, who I could be wrong, but seemed a little bit stuck in 2003. Well, with Big Sam, obviously, when he was at Bolton, he was ahead of the curve. Um, him and Alex Ferguson knew, you know, the next level of fitness would come by using implements and using special techniques, the like of um, employing sports scientists and using um, accelerated recovery protocols such as cryotherapy chambers, doing the Amiga wave, doing blood testing, even looking at teeth. So. And that's one of the reasons my father ended up working at Man United after the treble in 1999. And Big Sam was an expert in uh, really managing his players. He had a group of players who were um, the normal workers. And then he had these special players, these Diorkievs, these Campos, who were the special ones who we looked after. And that's what um, Alex Ferguson did when I was back there with Eric Cantona and stuff. But fast forward to Sunderland. Yeah, Big Sam knew certain players needed certain amounts of training and they have to get a certain amount of training otherwise they can't um, actually be ready for the match but certain days allude to certain levels of um, activity so Thursday is a great day for certain players who need to be managed like Wes, like um, Jan as a good day to do some either strength work in the gym or do some type of recovery protocol and by doing that it just allows their body just to be in a position where on Saturday they can actually still perform but again, when you talk about David Moyes, he was a little bit more like Roy Keane in that sense. But Roy Keane had a more robust team back. It was a championship team. And he didn't have all these um, bigger hitter stars who, who potentially were harder to manage. So, But David Moyes still had that mentality. I think he was he was at Everton, did wonderful with Everton. You know, and David Moyes, you know, he's, a, he's a good guy. Um, but he didn't bring anybody with him either. He, he come in on his own and he tried to take possibly too much on. Um, but also he, he liked to have a, a finger in all pies. He, he wanted to know what was happening everywhere and almost sort of manage that a little bit. And sometimes that can become restrictive to the, the, the actual staff members themselves. And maybe when the medical staff said, maybe for Jan, you know, maybe he needs to have a Thursday off or maybe not train quite as intensely in a certain day. And uh, David probably wanted them to train because that proved their fitness. So again, it's... Um, but, but, but Jan, you know, Jan's a, a, a very intelligent football player when it comes to the football side of things. But, you know, Jan himself made a few mistakes regarding his own um, understanding of his body. And I actually really spent a fair bit of time with Jan speaking about all things, not just football, but political and financial and all different bits and pieces. But Jan, for whatever reason, which, which I would say to all football players out there, you know, in your off season, you may get six weeks off. You know, you've got to be wise with the work you're doing that. Take a couple of weeks off to recover. And then you want to start to build up your endurance levels ultimately so you can be ready so when you come back for the pre-season to be able to play football. But what Jan did, like a fool, he, he did a marathon. For one, Jan was already a slow player. And Jan's actual um, tolerance to um, long endurance like that with his sore knees, his Achilles issues. You know, he did a marathon. I think it knocked him, knocked yeah. him. You know, and when he come back, he, he was knackered. 
and we were like, well, why did you even do that? And oh, I thought it was it was a good achievement. You know, start doing these achievements, like trying to do, you know, stupid things like skydiving or drinking as many sambukas as you want once your career is finished. Yeah. You know, but once you're in your career, once you've got an off season to really rest and prepare for your next season, do the right thing. So he made a few mistakes there. And I think he actually, you know, he really knocked himself for six doing that. His stupidity at his highest level, really. But Jan is a top guy and I wish him all the best. I think he's back out in Germany playing football. Uh, who's he playing for, did you say? With uh, FC Magdeburg at the moment in the Bundesliga Zwei, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. So, but he will always struggle with injuries. He's just got that makeup. He's, he's very long. He's, he's he finds it difficult to do um, continuous sort of strength training, and he finds issues because he's so tall with his back. But but Jan, he'll probably end up being a really good coach or manager or some type of philosopher. But um, yeah, Kirchhoff is a, <laughs> he's, a he's a he's a lovely guy. Yeah. You've just kind of reminded me of something. Actually, talking about like injuries and the um, you'd have worked with Jordan Henderson. And I remember there was a comment in Sir Alex Ferguson's book where he decided not to sign him because of the growth spurt that he had. What did he mean by that? And, and what what was your thoughts on that comment? Well, Jordan was a very interesting case. And Jordan's an excellent case of why why coaches need to give young players time to develop. And we looked at Jordan at 15 years old. He was small. He was weak. But his technical abilities were incredible. Um... And we had to make a decision whether to give him an apprenticeship at the time. And some people felt like he was probably never going to be uh, as physical or, or, or the level what he needed to be work, playing in the Premier League. However, um, myself, the sports scientist, the <coughs> medical department, you know, we could tell by his body shape, we could tell by his um, his maturity that he's not actually gone through his, his growth spurt. He's, he's what's called the peak height velocity, to give it the... Um, the scientific name so we knew there was a lot in there you looked at his parents and th- there's little measures you can do to work out you know wh- where are you on your um, uh, maturity um, ro- rate path and um, you can measure the wrist you can do um, a sit and see how tall they are but ultimately we knew give Jordan a bit more time and he'll be able to flourish and that's ultimately what we did sometimes instead of playing these better players always above their age with Jordan we even played him below his age group and just give him time physically spent a bit more time with him in the gym to give him the opportunity to be able to grow into himself and you know Jordan did that and Jordan become um, a real um, sort of pin up of uh, why you should allow players a little bit longer if they've not gone through their growth but early um, and he, he, he kicked on obviously he got his debut when, when Roy was there and they become, you know, an excellent, excellent player. He ultimately went to Liverpool, become England captain. And, you know, I'm proud to be able to say that in the summer I texted him while well, I was at the World Cup and wished him all the best. And it's great to see a local lad do really, really well. But, um, yeah, Alex Ferguson probably saw him when he was in his awkwardity stage where he was just got into Sunderland's first team. He just yeah. looked a bit gangly. And you can see um, a resemblance of when Gareth Bale just first started playing, this sort of gangliness, uh, not quite being able to be in full control themselves but give them a bit of time and I think Alex Ferguson looking back maybe maybe made a mistake by not taking Jordan because he, he'd become a solid player not only that Jordan's mentality you are talking about psychology mentality determination commitment to the football as a whole he's him and somebody like Cristiano Ronaldo or James Milner stand out as being people who you know really maximise what they've got and, and good to them and good for them Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAC, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAC is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAC, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. With um, Jordan Henderson, you mentioned before, obviously, I, I mean, uh, we interviewed Kevin Ball and he was saying how proud it is when you've been involved in the player's makeup and like their coaching, their, their fitness. And you see someone like Jordan Henderson, captain in Liverpool, potentially win the title this season. You look at him playing for England. It must be like immense pride seeing someone like that that you've worked quite closely with. But from a fitness perspective, is there any player that, has came to you with maybe you needed to mold into sort of like a project. I think the, the question I would be asking, 
what's the best recovery story you've got from like a certain player that you've had and thought this is going to be a challenge and they've, they've totally flourished under the project that you've created for them? Yeah, that's a good question because over the years you've obviously worked with lots of different players. <clears throat> we work with players who sometimes come on loan, the likes of, um, say, Danny Rose, um, the likes of Danny Welbeck, um, Johnny Evans, who, who come for a short period of time. And what you're trying to do there is, is, is give them a, a nice transition from their, their mother club through a period where there's a big, big change to them, you know, the, the physicality of playing first-team football every day and the first team football matches every weekend and making sure that process is, is nice and steady and um, they're not exposed to too much. So they're all nice little projects because you know the top players and you want to make sure they've got good service and each one of them players come and did really, really well. Um, when you get the likes of other players, like J Jermaine Defoe, and top players who really know how to look after themselves, Bolo Zenden, these type of players, you know they're quite easy to manage. you just got to give them a bit more one-to-one -one attention and um, ultimately, you know, just guide them on that path. And th they're quite simple projects. I suppose the longer term projects, when you get lads who get injured long time, it's maybe somebody like Kenwyn Jones, who I went through his entire sort of ACL injury, helping him from, you know, something really, really quite bad all the way to, to getting fully fit again. You know, there's a lot of reward in that. Um, you, you see him flourish afterwards and uh, that, that's nice to see. And there's many occasions there, but again, You'll see different um, practitioners throughout the entire um, time span of that, from the initial physio running on the pitch with the doctor trying to assess what it is to make a, a real snap judgment to see whether they need to take them off and to which surgeon you go and see. And that period of time, which then leads into... Um, a lot of time just being in the physio room day in day out the, the the masseurs doing loads of brilliant work obviously Craig Russell who's been a football player down at Sunderland and the work he does down there and uh, a lad we had called Richard Kaplan who's, a, who's another brilliant uh, masseur lad who's now gone on to do um, mortgages because of his own um, issues with the club but these things happen but then it's the physios working, getting them to be, you know, can they be mobile now? Can they be doing the simple movement patterns? Can they walk? Can they use the muscles properly? Then they start transitioning to uh, one of the guys we had, David Biddingsley, who's, who's a great physio, been there for years and years and years. He worked with me a lot because he was the rehab specialist. Uh, he's at Manchester United now. Yeah. Um, he's got down there and I'm, I'm really proud of what he does. And I've seen quite a lot because I'm in Manchester two or three times a week myself now. And he's working with with them players. And he's got a nice little gig down there because he's sort of added extra to everybody else. So when you get a bit of a long-term or short-term injury, he's like, Dave, where are you? What are you up to now? Oh, um, I've just got myself, I'm over in Dubai again. You know, I've got <laughs> five days with Lindelof and oh, I'm just, where are you now? I'm down in uh, down in Malaga. I've got six days with um, Sanchez. We need to work with his hamstring. <laughs> you know, he's absolutely falling on his feet, but it's about yeah. time he, he, he did as well. And, and and again, it's that process from that acute issue all the way maybe to nine months. And you know, you, you, every single day you're in the gym working with these players. And there's been many, but it's it's just a case of keeping them fresh, keeping the uh, the exercises and the challenges interesting, and ultimately just at the on the back of the mind, always remembering you know when you get back on that pitch, you know it's that's where your career is, that's what your passion is. Your your mum and dad have probably been taking you to football, you know, since five or six years old, and you know it's too easy. I mean, I've seen lots of lads, even Man United back in the day where you know somebody like Ben Thornley yeah he was, he's on my show next week great lad he ended up doing his ACL when Roy Keane did his ACL and they worked together but my dad did Roy Keane for nine months Ben worked with the other physios he didn't quite stay on top of his weight he didn't quite stay on top of his fitness then Ben struggled after that where Roy kicked on again so again these points in time when you get injured they can be the making or breaking of a player mentally and physically. So yeah, it's it's a it's a bit, they're all big projects when you know whether it's a a two week hamstring or whether it's a a, a nine month uh, long term injury. But um, you know the boys and the players who have to go through that, and sometimes the supporters and um, they don't always see that it's a hardship every day. Of, you know, getting through that period of time. So. I wanted to ask actually. I'm I'm pleased you came on to like sort of long term injuries. Um, Duncan Watmore. Obviously, still at the club, and I imagine you would have worked quite closely with with Duncan the first time, and then and then the second time. What what was it like working with him, and, and what kind of mental strength does that guy have? Because he seems pretty switched on, and that was devastating when it happened to him the second time. Well, I think Duncan he's not got much in the way of training history. So mm -hmm. he he was at Man United as a youth team player, then he he went to college and he went to. Um, 
altering and playing altering there. there. So yeah. when he came, he, he was quite um, a lightweight player, mm -hmm. but then he was exposed to a lot of football, and he's a fast, explosive player naturally. And w when he picked up his his first injury, it was obviously devastating to him. He's a bright lad. Um, he, he's got a degree. Um, he's a thinker. His mother and father, especially his father, has had some top jobs, and they really know um, how to bring up a good human being. So, yeah. regarding um, Duncan in around the club, he, he's been amazing. He's, he's he brings something different, and uh, um, I, I think apart from in his injuries, it's a shame there's not more lads like him within the football world because he just brings that. Um, that's something special, you know, quoting poetry or, you know, talking about um, the financial crises and all this type yeah. of stuff. And, you know, it was really good to have him around. It's somebody I really enjoyed working with and he worked really, really, really hard. But I suppose the problem is with these injuries, no matter how much work you do, occasionally if you get trapped into a certain position and force goes through your knee, you know, it can happen again. And, and with Duncan... And the, especially the type of player he is, he's always going to be vulnerable. And a bit like we talk about Johnny Williams, you know, I was down the other week, I was doing some work for um, lecturing for the what's called the PSFA. That's the, the Scouting Federation. And um, we were doing that, doing some assessment with some lads who wanted to be qualified scouts. And we went watching um, Charlton versus Accrington. And um, Johnny Williams was playing for Charlton. But he, he sucks players in. He's such a good player. He sucks players in. So he's getting he whacked. Every five minutes, he's falling on his shoulders. He's had both two shoulder like reconstructions, and you know all the time. So it's the nature of the game with Duncan. He just nips the ball just past the defender. So you've got a six foot two, um, big massive centre half about to clatter you. He's thinking he's going to get the ball and just leave a little bit on you. Duncan just nips it with his toe, and all that force is going straight through Duncan's leg. So Duncan's always going to be you know open to injury in the yeah. way he is, and unfortunately, as, as, as hard as we work and. Believe me, Duncan works as hard as anybody in the gym. You know, sometimes these recurrences can happen. And when you look at the statistics of that, you know, and there is a there. There's high percentages of, of re injuries with these type of ACL injuries and knee injuries. Uh, and back in the day, it used to be all you know, br people broke the leg. That was yeah. like the end of the careers. Yeah, of broken course. legs are quite easy to solve these days, but these knee injuries, cartilage injuries, ACL in injuries and all these meniscal tears and you know, it causes real issues regarding even how the muscle contracts in and around the knee to stabilize the knee so you know they, these are challenges which way above my pay grade people are trying to solve on a on a constant basis for surgeons and doctors so you know as, as long as the any player who gets these type of injuries you know it's really important to make sure they, they do a lot of gym work to strengthen up the muscles and try and make yourself as safe as possible but when you're on that match day and people are trying to smash you or falling on you sometimes these secondary injuries cannot be helped what's your thoughts on um and I'm, maybe this is personal opinion but someone who I, I love him because he's played for us for so long but i'm i'm aware how much he's could be aged but i always look at it that each injury he gets he comes back just rusty and a bit and a bit slower and, and i'm curious as to why why that happens to some players and i'm talking about lee catamore and yet somebody like i mean duncan what was yeah, he's he's not quite what he was when he was playing in the Premiership. But at the same time, Duncan's came back a very similar player. He doesn't look like he's scared of going to tackles. He doesn't look like he's lost any of his pace at all. Why is it some, and it might, and it might be an obvious answer, different bodies, different person, but why is it some players can come back pretty similar with all the attributes they had previously after a big injury or a succession of them? And someone like, say, sorry Lee, but Lee Catamore can come back and not, not quite be the same and be just a bit rusty. Is it all in the recovery or...? I think it's in uh, numerous different things. You know, Lee started playing football very young at a very high level. His 16, body, I think, yeah, wasn't it? His body's been through the absolute, you know, he's been through war after war after war after war. And over the years when we've actually stayed up, some most of the time Lee Catamore has been the very player who's galvanised that success. And there's a lot about Lee which is extremely positive. Also, Lee has his own. He's had his own issues in the past regarding, you know, sometimes behaviour, and he's, he's enjoyed a beer, and that's not um, something which is unknown. And uh, I suppose you know, the, the better you treat your body, uh, the more longevity it has. And when you get injured and you're picking up little issues all the time, and ultimately, unless you're hundred percent focused day in day out, day in day out, you know, you've got to work hard. You know, what I mean, really, really hard. You've got to push that pain threshold, that pain barrier. No, otherwise, it, 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 we all degrade with age anyway. We, yeah. we know that. So I think it's a combination of 
um, it's difficult you're injured you've been through the all, all them wars and going through the injury process when you, you can get bored and you can start being asked to do things you don't really want to do and it, it is an hard time I was speaking to Wes like I said yesterday and you know, the first two or three months players can handle, but when it's longer than that and they're being asked to do swimming again or they're being asked to do more strength work in the gym and it can become difficult and they sometimes shy away from it a little bit. And and ultimately, listen, it's a professional sport and you've got to be really, really pushing yourself all the time. So with Lee, I think he's picked up that many injuries over time, probably not got himself where his, his body's been. If you ask Lee quite rightly and fairly he's probably never played a game where he's not felt some type of ache or pain mm -hmm. and he's willing to go through that and that's always an injury risk and um, he's a brave player he's, he's certainly somebody I'd have in the trenches with me um, but also over time like you say he's, he's probably physicality is, is just started to drop so you know Lee has a lot of qualities and um, I'm certainly proud to say that I've um, worked with him over the years Away from the medical stuff and maybe onto the more personal stuff of your time when you were at Sunderland um, straightforward question and you can give me a, a why behind it or you, or you don't have to who was your, your favourite manager to work with throughout your, your tenure without doubt Roy Keane but that, that because I had a, you know, a certain amount of authority with that mm -hmm. you know I was his guy there for whatever I said and got done and got delivered upon which was fine so uh, when Roy went to um, Ipswich um I, I was asked to go with him. Um, I actually went down to Ipswich. Which I met Roy, Tony Lachlan, and the, uh, the the sports scientist there called Antonio Gomez. Brilliant sports scientist again. He now works for Barcelona first team. And I looked at that project, and um, you know, I almost I almost went to tell you the truth, but I actually played for Ipswich as well. And um, on the way back, I um, I stopped at the hotel where I stayed previously as a player, and I just got a little bit of an awkward feeling. I went back to see Laura, my wife, and um, I just said, I'm not quite sure. You know, it, it's, it's good money. It's an opportunity to be with Roy again, and Roy obviously trusts me. And I'm not quite sure who's coming in as, as, the, as the next manager. And I said, oh, you know, I think it's right for us as a family to, to sort of stay here. But but then Steve Bruce rung me, and it, it just it solved a real issue with me. And uh, yeah. I ended up staying at Sunderland, and now Quinn got on the phone, and Steve Bruce and the doc, and said, you know, we want you to stay. And it made it easier, family life. And Roy fell out with me. <laughs> Fair enough. He fell out with me for a couple of years. Um, we've made up since then. And he's, he's, he's been, Roy's been incredible with me, you know, honestly. The, the two years we fell out, I remember having dreams at night time. And I was like, oh, my God, if I see Roy somewhere. <laughs> I, 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 honestly, like nightmares, you know. So uh, it ended up getting solved. And the, more recently, obviously, we, Liam Miller died in, yeah, in his... Sadly, um, yeah pancreatic cancer and that was a sad day but they did a football match over in Cork for him um, a tri tribute game and Roy asked me to go over there and um, that was nice to be a part of and, and Liam was a great guy and um, it's a shame that happened he's got such a lovely family um, but, but Roy again little things like that he, he's, he sort of looked after me over the years but so yeah, I, I stayed at Sunderland then. I, I loved being with Roy. With Steve, it was different again. He brought his own person. They all brought their own persons. I, I really liked Gus Poyer. I thought he had um, something about him which um, um, I liked. He, I liked the staff he brought with him. Um, but at that moment in time, it was, it was interesting because we just had that sporting director um, role. Um, we had um, Lee... Lee Congerton. Yeah, so we had Lee Congerton. Trying to erase him from memory, you see. Yeah, so, <laughs> so we had Lee Congerton at the club at that moment in time, and um, they were trying to try the, this new thing. I think we, we had managers, and then I think DeFanti come in as as um, a sporting director, then Lee Congerton got the job. And when, oh no, I can't remember exactly it the timing now. It's the other way around. First and then, yeah. then Congerton afterwards, yeah. But, but there was a real awkwardness in the club where it was, it was like the first team against everybody else and but Gus he was always in the in the gym he was always in the head tennis place where we used to play head tennis together we were always in the um uh, the medical room and he was saying come on boys it's about us we are not change anything else it's not about this it's not about that it's not about upstairs and he just brought this spirit you know I don't think we, we conceded many goals that year I think we got to Wembley yep. in the cup and there was something special about Gus and um it was, it, it was strange it was almost like we, it was us against the world it's almost like a mentality which I didn't really get from other managers you know obviously I like Big Sam in the sense of what he brought 
um, um, because he'd give everybody empowerment. And the other managers would come and go. They all had their different traits. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed working definitely with Roy and, and, and with Gus. Who was, and again, it would be nice if you had a reason behind it, but I'm aware I'm digging. Um, who was your least favourite manager to work under? Well, see, I travelled to every single pre-season tour. Yeah. And I loved it. Whether it was going to Ireland uh, with Roy, whether it was going to um, Portugal with um, uh, Steve Bruce, whether it was going to um, South Korea with uh, Martin O'Neill, we went over to California and Toronto with uh, Dick Advocat. We went everywhere. It was incredible. But the one manager... I know where you're going. <laughs> no, no. I didn't go on the pre-season tour to Italy. Do you know why? Because I said to him, I said, listen, my wife, she's having... I missed the birth of my first child. And then my second child was um, due to give birth. And even though most people was like a bit awkward with um, Di Canio, I actually spoke to him and um, said, no, I, I normally travel, but um, this time I prefer not to travel for this occasion. And he was fine. And he even sent me a text um, when my baby was born, um, Gabe, just to say congratulations. So in that sense, he certainly had something about him. Um, Di Canio was... Um, he was fine. I, I quite liked him. Um, again, I think that's because he had a football history. He mm -hmm. had a sports scientist called um, Donatelli, Claudio Donatelli. He was the weirdest guy I've ever met. <laughs> he was—I don't even think he spoke. <laughs> he spoke a little bit of English. I just—he was just weird. He was just weird. He, I always remember when we used to do sit-ups in the gym or do some. He used to—he used to click like this, and he used to do like ten minutes, <laughs> ten minutes of sit-ups. Then say, oh, Mike, you take the rest of the session. And they just stand there watching. I thought, you weird guy. You're obviously not got a clue what you do in the gym. You might be able to do aerobic stuff and the stuff outside and a few sit ups. But, you know, you know I, I, there are criti you know, I could criticize every manager for one aspect, yeah. and there's, they've got aspects which are good as well. So, you know, uh, on, on that note, you know, even like Chris Coleman, brilliant guy. What a nice guy. Yeah. He was brilliant. Unfortunately, it, it didn't go well for him. And all the way through Martin O'Neill, he was, oh, Martin O'Neill, what a guy, you know? He's an incredible guy. He's, he's almost, he's eccentric. He, he's strange, but he's brilliant as well at the same. You know, I'm just proud to have been able to, would I have enjoyed a, w 10 years just with Roy, of course? Would I have I enjoyed the last 12 years with 12 different managers? Yeah, it's brought so much more to me as a, as a yeah. character and seeing all these different styles. How did you find, um, you just reminded me going through the, the, the plays and stuff like that. Simon Grayson. Yeah, Simon Grayson was an interesting one. I didn't know Simon. He'd come in, and I almost felt like that was a, a right decision. We'd just been relegated, of course, and he wanted somebody who knew that uh, that division. Um, he, he brought us an assistant as well, funny little fella. Um, and we went over to, um, I think we went to Austria for a pre-season tour. Um, we had a right good pre-season there. Um, but again, I, I just felt like it, it was under a certain amount of pressure. It was a difficult stage. We had some players who really, not not that there was too good to be there, but it was a different style. You had you know, Wabi Kazri, you had um, Lamin Corney. You, you had certain players there who you thought, mm, they don't really fit what he's trying to do. Yeah. And ultimately, I had to make that, that big decision of trying to get them players out and bring the more British players in and allow some of the younger lads to come up and through. And um, that's great for the young players who did do that. You know, yeah. you, you look at what happened in that season, the likes of George and Honeyman becoming really established and Josh Madger getting in the team and doing really well. Um, so for everybody's um, the nightmare of being rele relegated a couple of times, for other people, it's, it's their heaven. You know, so uh, Grayson was a, was a nice fella. Ultimately, it didn't work out for him and maybe a bit unfairly on Netflix, I think it comes across um, quite poor on him, which is unfortunate. Um, but anyway, let's talk about the Netflix. How good a show is that? I was going to say, you've gone bang on to my next question. You're doing brilliant and just moving me on to the question I'm going to ask. It's fantastic. You like, can tell I interview people, eh? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it should be switching around, but I'm not quite as interesting, to be honest. But, um, <laughs> when it comes to the Netflix series, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. And um, Johnny actually interviewed the guys who made it. Um, and I thought it was a really, really good good bit of crack room because obviously something daft. Um, I loved watching it. My wife even enjoyed watching it. I've got a few friends in Berlin who were just like, your club's crazy. This is amazing. But how fair was it? Was it like the way it comes across? 
I'll put it this way. I learned some things from it, you know. Mm-hmm. The first of all, I, I must admit, when I turned it on, I thought, oh, my God, this could, this could be tragic in many ways. <laughs> and also I thought it's going to be entertaining. But do you know what I loved about it? Just that opening opening um, 30 seconds, that opening minute, just the song, just yeah. the way they put that together. I mean, even now, just thinking about it, sends tingles up my body. You know, I'm not even from the area, but when I was watching that, it brought every time I watched the next episode, it actually brought a tear to my eye. And I just thought, you know, I'm proud to be, you know, a part of this Sunderland journey, yeah. knowing, however, it's about to just show the worst of the worst. But, it, you know, you, well, I think what it does do, and I think what it does do to the rest of the planet, uh, it shows you know, how passionate Sunderland people are about their football. It shows the likes of Kevin Ball and it shows the likes of um, just the general people, how, how much it means to them because Sunderland was obviously an affluent area a, a long time ago, 100 years ago. And you know, through different economic times, it, it, it's fallen on tough times, but football is its core, football is its heart. And no matter where I go in the rest of the country, you know, I think there's, there's probably more women in Sunderland that know about football than anywhere else. And uh, uh, I, I'm just a proud you know, want to be Mackin, so to speak. So when I watch the series, and you, 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 we, it starts off, doesn't it, when we're playing Celtic? And we get <laughs> God, absolutely smashed against Celtic. <laughs> yeah. And I'm watching it myself Nailed with it. my son thinking, wow, God, this, this is going to be, this is going to be tough, you know? Yeah. And from that point, you just felt, you know, certain players like Vaughny and, and Graben and, you know, McGeady, these are good players, but, it just didn't happen, did it? No. It just did not happen. And the issue with Jack Rodwell and around the struggle with the club, knowing that Ellis wanted to get rid of the club, and it just it almost felt like it was devaluing every day. Uh, we saw some reports coming about, about about the financial position it was in, and it was just a dreadful... It was It was difficult for the staff members. It was difficult for the players as well because in the most awkward time in the club's more recent sort of decade history, there was cameras everywhere. Yeah. And it even caused, I felt, you know, maybe that accelerated fit in the club, which was already there. I, I do think, looking back, if I was Martin Byrne or Ellis Short themselves, I think it was a poor decision mm-hmm. to allow the Netflix cameras to be there at that time. I think it made a great show. And I, and I think that the guys who made it, I think they call, they call Full Well 73. Yeah. I think they tried to put out there because they are Sunderland fans a positive story in a very negative light, and they tried to focus on the likes of Joyce uh, and the chef Patrick and little cameo roles from the guy I don't know who was doing the taxi driver. Yeah. But ultimately, there's some nice stories in there, but it just showing the passion of the Sunderland fans, and it was horrible to see, you know, when it was loss after loss after loss, and you know, it was sad. I used to remember walking out of the stadium feeling proud as punch when we used to. You know, beat teams whether it was Man United or Newcastle, and, and then they were suddenly losing about against all these you know poor teams in in your mind, but difficult teams in reality in 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 the Championship, and you know you're almost walking out of the stadium with your head down, feeling a bit embarrassed. So, but the Netflix documentary itself was you know it, it was it was good, and I know they continued this season. I think. Yeah, they have been have been doing it allegedly. Uh, I think the we'll wait. I, th- I think they're waiting for it to see if Netflix will pick it up. Yeah. I'd be really surprised if they don't. I mean, hopefully, Jack Ross and uh, Stuart Donald and the rest of the boys on there getting the playoffs all get promoted, and we we do you know go up because that would be a lovely. Um, sort of mirror image of the year before yeah. and hopefully there's loads of people and fans saying yeah we got it to how it should be and we all want in this area to get it back to the you know to the Peter Reid days and the Quinn and the and the Kevin Phillips days because they were, they were great times for the club and sometimes even back then I remember when we come 10th with Brucey and the fans were happy fast forward you know 10 years and you, you're getting relegated from the championship and you sometimes just got to stick with, you know, not everything is always. You want listen to them up the road at Newcastle. You know, it's embarrassing what goes on up there. Yeah. You know, they think they're a big club. They've never won anything years, and um, you know. Going to Parliament now. <laughs> the pardon? They took it to Parliament. Yeah. The way the club's been run, it was in Parliament. Yeah. A right. Labour MP, their Labour MP, took it to to Parliament that he, uh, he, Mike Ashley wasn't spending the money correctly or something. Well, it was the hub of the. The well, hub of the community. Well, nothing surprises me there with what he he's like or or, or what the, that club's like because, you know, it is a big club and the fans are passionate up there as well. Um, but um, 
you know, for, for me, you know, so until so I die, I suppose. <laughs> good answer, mate. Really good answer. Um, there's a, a big myth that I kind of want to, I, I, in a way, I want to quash it or I want a bit of um, or your opinion on it. And I've asked a few people the same in the fan base for a long, long time through that sort of, it wasn't a 10-year period of struggle. It was about five. A lot of people talked about the rotten core and it just came out of nowhere, this, the rotten core. And a lot of people pointed at like senior professionals like John O'Shea, Lee Catamore, <clears throat> because they were there for that long. Now, I've spoke to a variation of players from throughout that period who've played under John O'Shea and Catamore and give or take one or two negative comments. They've all been really, really positive about John O'Shea. And I think Stephen Pienaar says I, I, he couldn't understand why people even thought that about someone like John O'Shea because he was the one that would keep everyone galvanised and together. So my question wouldn't be, is John O'Shea part of the rotten core? Because I don't think he is. But what do you think the issue was? Because like, there was obviously like a, some sort of poison in the dressing room. Where did that come from? When did it start? And how did it manifest itself? Well, John O'Shea is definitely not part of that because John O'Shea is an absolute diamond. And somebody who tried... He was, he was almost like the, the second manager and... Um, he could highlight issues and he, he tried to bring a, a lot of that to having the players having their own meetings and going out for meals and trying to get um, good team bonding. I suppose the rotten core, which is, is obviously not a nice word, it, I think it's something that probably stems from what I class as... Um, so it's, it's then people who are very, very highly paid, but they have no heart. Yeah. You know, I think that's because of the way the transfer system was and the monies. I think something had a lot of them, I and mean, the constant flow of um, players who were coming to the club. They probably didn't even know where the club was. They probably didn't have. A, if you said to them before signing, was they're going to get their twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty grand? There's a pin. Put it on the map. You know, yeah. they wouldn't even be able to know where something was. You know, I think they end up bringing a lot of them players and maybe too many foreign players who ultimately didn't have the best interests of the club at heart. Yeah. And I think that was the rotten peripheral core. I think the core, if you're talking about the right people, even the likes of Lee, uh, uh, John, um, uh, even somebody like Vito Manoni, very good, solid players who really wanted the best. I, I think the peripheral core in around that, you know, the five or six who, who maybe didn't really buy into what it was all about and they weren't committed. But that rotten core sort of span from year to year with different players because different manager comes in and brings in different players who didn't quite have the, the same feel and the same um, the love of, of what Sunderland was and the, 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 the middle core stayed static so to speak with John and Lee and a couple of other players and then you had this sort of five or six mercenaries is the word I call yeah, mercenaries yeah. we've well, had many that, of them that's the word mercenary <laughs> after mercenary after mercenary Basically fleecing the club in my eyes. Yeah. And then you'd have the, the, the more outer skirts of that, the likes of, you know, Honeyman and the likes of um, players who have been around the club for years and years and years, who 100% had the best interest of the club at heart and the staff members and maybe the people who've been working at the Black Cat House for years who, who really had a passion, the groundsmen, um, you know, the kitman, Cookie there and Stevie and all them type of people. We could see it, but you can't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, you uh, know, <laughs> Nice guy. We had a, a player called Reberge. Remember him? A Valentin Reberge. I do. What well, a nice guy. I remember him saying to the manager, I can't play. I'm not mentally right to play. And there were situations like that where you think, what on earth are you talking about? Yeah. You, you, you're getting paid. And now you're saying you can't play when the manager asks you to play, whether that's through nerves or it doesn't. Qu you know, there was certain players at certain times where really you knew they threw in the towel. Uh, you, you knew they wasn't giving 100% in training. And, and it become, unfortunately, for, in my eyes, suddenly become like an easy paycheck for some people. Yeah. You know, a lot of agents and panic buyers and someone obviously wanted to stay in the Premier League. Um, and, and ultimately, I think that is what the rotten core was. But I wouldn't call it the rotten core. I would call it the uh, the rotten sort of second tier of what the club had. Yeah. So there's like good people, like Honeyman stuff out in the fringes. Cookie, who's been there years as well. You obviously there, you know, not been on a decade at that point. Um, it was just mercenaries. Tell you now, would you agents of mercenaries is what spoiled football in general? Oh yeah. So I, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know what needs to be done with that. I mean, I, some people say, "Oh, Ronaldo's on too much money. Messi's on too much money." You know, 
when you watch a film and say it's um, Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise is on a fortune, quite yeah. rightly he brings in the crowd. And all the other actors, they're not on as much. And what's happened in football, you get obviously very, very high levels of pay if you're brilliant. And there's such high levels of pay because of all the advertisements and the TV channels. But instead of like the top players, I think Ronaldo and Messi should be on twice as much as they're on. And all the average players should be on half as much as they're on. Because yeah. ultimately, they're just making up the numbers on the football pitch. We want to be entertained. And when you see bang average players coming from all over, you know, the, you know, well, yeah, it's easy. You know, he's played 20 times for um, a foreign team. So therefore, we think he'll be good and be able to handle it. Um, so we'll give him five times as much as what you could give a youth team player coming through who ultimately will never get a chance. But if you don't bring that that player over, get a youth team player up, get him 20, 30 games, pay him a fifth of what he's getting. Now we're getting another British player who can ultimately go and play for England. It just becomes so survivalist. And it's almost... You know, that, but I think that's society at this moment in time. Yeah. How many people actually save up before they buy something? Oh. You know, everything's on the tick. Everything's on on the credit card and I just think the culture the financial system the culture of football the culture of personal people's own personal finances it's just wrong yeah and it was so I mean you look at I'm not even going to like touch on individuals because I don't, I don't need to ask you if we're not going to include Ndong and people like Papi Dilabodji in that because of what happened they got sacked by the club we paid 21 million for them too and God knows how much money they were on but an interesting one, again, I'll go back to, to Jack Rodwell. I think a lot of people would include someone like Jack Rodwell as a mercenary because of the alleged reason that he didn't want to play. There was that bit in the Netflix documentary where I think it's Darren Gibson says he played on Saturday and he says, not a chance, mate. We don't know the context of that in full. But Jack Rodwell came from Man City, really highly rated young player, um, had his injury issues and stuff like that. And Jack Rodwell regressed so much and he just went inside himself so much. Do you think it's fair to include someone like Jack Rodwell in that as a mercenary? Do you think it was just consequence? Or did, was Jack Rodwell not the right personality for Sunderland Football Club? I think for me, it's all about how you structure the salary. Mm -hmm. You know, if Jack Rodwell's on 70 grand a week, if he is, right, which is a lot of money, that's more than, you know, that's double, treble most people's annual salary. Yeah. You know, there's got to be some Trouble type man. of, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's got to be um, uh, reward through um, activity. Yes. And I, I think they've got to start rethinking the, the, the structure, you know, because if Jack Rodwell is playing every single game and he is of that level and that pedigree, that's why we've got him, of course he deserves that money. You know, the club does well and he plays well and he's scoring goals and he's, he's, he's playing all these minutes. He deserves more. Yeah. But if somebody else comes and for whatever reason um, that they're having issues, then ultimately there should be a, it should be like a scale system. And I'm not saying I, I'm solving this question right now. I'm not even put that much thought into it, you know, but mm -hmm. ultimately I think, um, you know, players when you're being, um, when you're being signed, their agents, of agents for a reason you know they're trying to get the most money for the client which ultimately means the most money for themselves and they're always going to push the boat and they're always going to look at what circumstance the club's in and also you've got to look at the integrity of the of the deal regarding you know, who's making the deal and why i think there's there's probably a, a little bit of corruption within our, our football clubs work with different agents and bits and pieces you know it's, it's been renowned without the football world and how do you solve that as well so you know wherever there's Lots of money. There's going to be corrupt people and people trying to, um, you know, fleece the system and also do things wrong. But um, for me, uh, mercenaries <laughs> everywhere in football. But ultimately, when you do get a good group of lads together, and when you do get the right manager who can lead from the top, once you do get the board and you get the fans and everything uh, all all sits together really well, you can have special special seasons, and that's ultimately what Sunderland want to get back to. Um, that's what I had when I was at Man United. That's what I had when we come here with Roy Keane on that on that first season. And even we had mini glimpses of that each time. Remember all them times yeah. we survived in the last you know, ten games. It was like mini miracles, and it, it, it filled you up that summer thinking this is amazing. Imagine what next season is going to be like. And only, I only can imagine. I was speaking to my wife earlier before coming here, saying, you know, "What would have happened if Big Sam would have stayed?" Oh, the age-old question: If England hadn't lost against Iceland, where would we be? Age-old question. I loved Big Sam. Loved him. Thought he's brilliant. Thought someone who completely got the area. I think something is a different club in that, and it's like I think maybe I'm being unfair, but we're talking about mercenaries. 
think you can go to somewhere like Crystal Palace where the player can kind of amuse himself in London. You can go to a West Ham. In Sunderland, you've got to get the area. You can't just come and be on big money and just not give you all because that's all we care about. The North is like that in general. Places like Leeds are very similar. No, I agree. I think that's one of the, the major issues why Sunderland and even Newcastle end up picking up certain players. Yes. You know, and they, they do struggle, therefore, to either settle or they're just here just for the money, you know, because, you know, unfortunately, you know, to, to be a Macken or to be a Geordie, you've got to have something, a, you know, a bit deeper about yourself. You you know, even myself, I get out of my car, I could be driving along. I'd be, kind of be even in like Cleedon or wherever I am or try to get back to my, where I live, get out of the car and it's, the wind is unbelievable. I've never known so much. It should be called Winderland. <laughs> mind Sunderland, you know, and it's always about 10 degrees cooler than everywhere else in the country. Yeah. And occasionally when it is sunny, you know, you get that lovely sea fog covering you. So you're absolutely freezing again. And then all night you've got that buzz of the flipping lighthouse noise. So, you know, Sunderland are, are the different people as a whole. And, uh, you know, I love them. And you know, half my family is, you know, the Mackhams and, uh, you know, they're, they're just brilliant, brilliant people. I never once felt not safe in Sunderland. Yeah. And when I go back down to Manchester now on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in and around Manchester, Thameside, Ashton, I'm thinking, gosh, wow, this is this is a little, a little bit, come back to Sunderland, I'm just like, this is an absolute breath of fresh air. It's a lovely environment. And that's why I don't want to relocate with the family. I think it's a safe, happy environment where people have got, you know, really good um, and ethical, you know, and heart and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. Who knows where life would have took me, but to bring me to Sunderland just sits really well with me. I went out for the first time in a long, long time last night. That's why my eyes are a little bit black, but thankfully this is audio, not visual. So <laughs> no one's going to click. But just to end then, I think uh, what I really want to end on a positive because I think there's been a lot of positive, but we've touched on some negative and I want to end on a positive with it, definitely. Um, what's your favourite memory from your time at Sunderland? I think my favourite time was obviously getting promoted. When Roy King was here, um, I remember, um, all, well, first of all, we ended up losing a game against Colchester and it oh, sort yeah. of just knocked off, off the tracks and there was there was a little mini panic. I remember being up in the office, there was me and Scott Ainsley and um, uh, Ricky Sprazier and uh, well, I don't even think Ricky was there then actually, but Neil Bailey, uh, Mick Brown, Roy and Tony Lachlan were like, oh my God, right, lads, we need to, we've lost. They've been on this amazing run. But just let's get it back together. So anyway, we got back on the on the winning. Um, I think we played. Who did we play Burnley. away? We played Burnley away. Oh, away from home. Um, when we actually, I think somebody lost. We anyway, the staff. We went out in Durham, and the the, the other team Derby. was playing. Somebody somebody Derby. played and lost. So it meant we was. We played on the Friday. We won, and yeah. then I think Derby had a match our result the next day and, and didn't I think so we knew that if they lost we was going to be um, promoted we yep. wouldn't have been the champions but promoted at that moment in time Yes. and now uh, we went down to Durham um, all the staff members Roy didn't come with us he never did but um, <laughs> no he, he did but not when we went for a drink but um, so we all had this sort of mini could it be the day we get promoted and one of my good friends at the time was called a guy called Pete Fryer. He uh, was the physio. head of Ed Physio now. He's a good friend. He's out in Ferenvaris, which is um, a club in Hungary. Um, and we was out in Durham and we was watching the game. And in a way, it sort of took out a little bit of like um, the excitement because somebody else lost for us to be promoted. Yeah. But um, I remember we, we, we had a brilliant night. We were celebrating and it was, it was absolutely brilliant out in Durham. And from that, what Roy did, and this is the type of guy he was, because we used to always go on um, team bonding trips. We used to go, um, went down to Seaside doing whitewater rafting. We went over to um, the lakes doing um, go-karting, all team bonding stuff. We used to go doing um, um, them fast cars, what they called? Oh, uh, like quad bikes and stuff? Yeah, but we, there's just one there in Seam. Uh, where you go doing all the oh, uh, go karting? Yes. We, we used to yeah. look, yeah, we used to love doing that. And he, he actually said at the end of the season, right, lads, we've been promoted. You've done an absolute brilliant job. And he took us all to Monaco. Nice. We all went to Monaco. There's about twelve staff went to Monaco. Uh, took the the masseurs there as well. Um, and it was just amazing. You know, we were walking around because when that is, it's just before the Formula One Grand Prix. Yeah. So we're walking around the Grand Prix and we're having a bit of calamari at the uh, at the harbour there and just thinking, this is it, knowing that we're going to go into the Premier League. And that, that was a great memory. 
But again, sometimes when we survived on the last minute, got a lovely picture where I was on the pitch, me and my little lad, Rafe, he's nine now, so he's probably about seven then. You know, when Big Sam was doing the, the old... Oh, the Hulk. Old, he's doing the Hulk, <laughs> and he's pulling his top off and all that, and <laughs> there's a caption there where me and my little lad are just behind him. And after that, we went into the, the hotel just next to the stadium, and um, me and Adrian and a couple of the close staff and... Ellis and Big Sam was there talking to, you know, just about the future and how it would be and having a few glasses of red wine and you know, these these stick long in memories because they're the great evenings and it's about the feeling in it and that's what football's yeah, about and that's why it's so passionate. It's it's not an analytical sport. It's the feeling and you know when you score a goal or when you get promoted or when you when you do get even get relegated. It's that feeling and that's why football is the world sport and I'm proud to have been a part of that all my life. You know, and the things I'm doing in the future. You know, I've got so many great adventures myself, which um, you know, hopefully we might talk about. I was going to say, before we sort of you know, touch on, it's been great speaking. Really, really, really enjoyed it. And Thank I you. said to you before, and I was excited to speak about it, because I think there was definitely stories there, and you've, you've definitely shown that. And a lot of expertise of things people might not know what actually you, you did at the club, because yeah. it's I'm certainly not part of uh, sports, um, as you can tell. Okay. But... Um, where can people because you obviously do your own podcast now which is really interesting you've just done one with Wes Brown um, but where can we follow you where can we subscribe where can we where can we ask you questions <laughs> sure yeah I mean so a couple of ways one we'll start with a YouTube channel yeah. so it's um, just Mike Clegg um, underscore MSC but if you just type in on, on Google Mike Clegg and uh, podcast you'll see that there I've just done three at this moment in time. I've done one just about myself to introduce myself back into the, the wider community. And a lot of that's talking about Sunderland and the great times I had here. Um, then the next one's Quinton Fortune. He's possibly my best friend in football. Obviously, the South African guy who um, played in a couple of World Cups and played for Man United. He came to Sunderland. He stayed at my house for three months when he was on, on, on trial here. With, with, oh, I forgot when, he when was Roy on was trial here, yeah. Quinton Fortune. That's right, you know, yeah. The Roy, the type of guy he is, said, so no, you're not good enough, so goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Roy and Quinton get on really well. Um, and then I just done the, the Wes Brown one last night, um, which again, we talk about Sunderland and the time we had here. And how we managed his actual injury um, through that process. Um, but I, I split it into four sections. The first section, I talk about topical football issues, what's happening in that week. A lot about Man United, just because that's... Um, in Manchester, the show obviously has always been about Sunderland. I'll let you off for that. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, then topical things, you know, more recently, uh, Eric Harrison, my youth team coach, he died this week really, and really died, talking yeah. about that and um, Gordon Banks died. So we get to talk about topical things. Um, I've more recently just become um, an ambassador for, I'm sponsoring my local team, Curzon Ashton. I've seen that yeah. actually, yeah, yeah. So uh, my, my, my brand or, or my business, which is called um, Seed of Speed, which is one branch of a couple of businesses I'm doing, and that's athletic training. So we have a, a gym itself, which is on the floor, so to speak, where it's only for athletes, um, not for the general public, where they can train. That's where my father practices out of with three or four of his coaches. And then we're setting up the online training platform, where, which will be hopefully go worldwide as time progresses. That's just gone live last week. So anybody who wants to be better at a particular sport, it doesn't have to be football, we, we sort of manage that and we do that on WhatsApp and we do all types of different um, baseline testing, setting out six-week training plans. Um, so that's that. But the YouTube is, is the one um, which I'm enjoying doing at this moment in time. So, yeah, uh, and Twitter's the same. So everything on our social media, it's Mike Clegg underscore MSC. And with that, I, I'm trying to just collate... Um, just best practice and really good stories um, from my time. I'll be speaking to my scout and why he scouted me. I'll be speaking to my first coaches, speaking to the players I've worked with, um, speaking to experts in nutrition, psychology. Um, I'll end up speaking to people in business management and ch chief executive of football teams. I've even had the likes of the charlatans and the group ringing yeah. me up saying, can we come on your podcast? And, Amazing. You know, yeah. Because they're Man United fans and they're trying to get that link. I'm also an ambassador for Diane Medal, um, for her um, sporting trust and trying to help kids to spend less time on the streets and more time in, in, in secure environments where they can actually practice things they would never be able to normally, like cooking and sports and arts and crafts. 
yeah, so I've, I've got a real project going on and I'm doing a lot with the local community in Termside regarding um, ch children's health and awareness of obesity and all that type of stuff. But sorry, I've gone off track slightly. So I've got four mini segments. I do the topical football, my podcast. I do a section which is called um, Evil Sync, which is all about health and well-being. So this week's all about sleep and how, how, to, uh, how sleep um, can make you have a, a good life or a bad life in the sense that it has a... Uh, a real um, effect on the way you can be productive not just as a sportsman but also as general uh, well-being and then a little section where each time I get um, um, a client coming in or I interview they sign one of my shirts it's my winner shirt from the 1999 treble yep. time and at the end of this series which will be at the end of the season and that's going to be um, given away to a subscriber, depending on Amazing. Uh, some type. We're going to do it like some type of prize show. I think it's, we're going to do it something like you, know, um, you with your parents or you with your, your child or with your friends doing something sport act um, related where it's quite funny, something where we can get lots of subscriber interaction. Well, I have just described, so oh, I'll, thank you. I'll, I'll slip you a wee bribe before we leave um but mike thanks so much for coming on i think it's been really really like i say really really interesting and i thank you very very much for getting up early this morning i made a, a bad executive decision to go out at about three o'clock last night but i think i've coped <laughs> well, listen, i've really enjoyed it i really really enjoyed it and uh oh, well we can do it again in the future i suppose and uh, massively yeah that'd be to, amazing to everybody who listens to this podcast and sundown fans you know all the best for the the, the rest of the season and hopefully jack ross and Stuart donald can push the club on and get into the championship and then back into the Premier League. So good luck, everybody, and uh, wish you all the best. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly.